Good everybody, and happy Halloween. And uh, first, I would like to thank Katie and Simone for organizing this really great event. I really enjoy this and uh, enjoy my stay here. So um, what I'm going to talk about is a, is a more like a control problem. Uh, is a density control of a swamp system. And uh, I was actually going through the, the work I have done to see which one is uh, more related to PDE. I think this one could be the most relevant one. And uh, this talk is going to be light in the sense there will be no theorems or proofs. So I think this is suitable for Friday. Um, so um, what we are interested in is the SWAN formation control. So what, the, um, so what is a SWAN? And this talk is close, closely related to the talk this morning by Olga and also this talk by Sui just a while ago. So what we are interested in is really the SWAN. So a SWAN is just a collection of individuals. And uh, specifically here, we have a robot. And uh, what we want to do is we want to find a common strategy. So if each of the robot apply the same strategy, they are going to do what we want them to do. So this is a goal. For instance, this is a, um, this is a John uh, Let Show by Intel. So, and you can see they can form specific uh, formation you want them to do. Okay, so uh, recently a very popular approach of doing this is really to view these uh, swarms as a distribution. The reason we can do this is because in this uh, formation control, it really doesn't matter. For instance, if I want to control this, like maybe a few hundred robots from this configuration to this configuration, is that indistinguishable to each other. It doesn't matter whether this robot goes well or this goes well, uh, as long as uh, the final configuration looks like this, then it's fine. So that is a, a major difference between this type of control problem with the classic control problem where you really want to uh, control the performance of each individual. So they are indistinguishable to each other. And uh, due to this reason, basically, it's very natural to model the configuration of the robot as a distribution. So uh, for instance, we can model this as this distribution and this as this distribution. And uh, then the goal would be to find a some specific map to go from this configuration to this configuration. You can either use optimal transport map or you can use gradient flow. So eventually you would converge there. So one major problem in most existing work is that uh, the collision avoidance interaction is ignored. So uh, for most uh, uh, realistic SWAN control systems, uh, even though you can apply whatever fancy policy you have, but at the real lowest level, every robot has to, uh, in, in, you have to enforce a, a, a collision avoidance mechanism there. Otherwise they would hit each other. And this is very important uh, in practice. So, but in most existing work, this is largely ignored. So what uh, I'm going to present is uh, one potential approach to really take this into account when you design your control policy, okay? So most specifically, um, this is the uh, system. So let's say we have N agent. They share basically the same dynamics. So they interact with each other with this uh, uh, interaction kernel here. And the U is really the control for this agent. And uh, then you have the noise there. And if epsilon is zero, the, this corresponds to deterministic dynamics, which is fine. So our goal is to find a strategy, which is uh, the same for everybody, but uh, could be time varying. Okay. So our goal is to find this strategy. So if everybody here use this strategy, then they would uh, go from this initial configuration, which is approximately some distribution to this target configuration. And uh, we also want to import some optimality. So a natural condition is to say, okay, I want to minimize the total effort. So that is, uh, that is the problem formulation, okay? And feel free to stop me if you have any questions. This is more like an engineering talk. <laughs> uh, a lot of questions though. The XI uh, depends only. Huh? The xi, yes, it's only a, on one argument, not yeah. the density. Or is a 
yeah. or empirical. Thanks, Chu Feng. Uh, it's important to emphasize this is a fully decentralized control policy. You don't need to really, after the policy is fixed, you don't need to talk to your neighbors to do anything. Um, uh, the interaction is uh, inclu included already in the designing process of this. Uh, no, no, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, we don't penalize this. We assume this is already enough to ensure this. So the subject has a strong response Yes, zero. yes, exactly. Thank you, Thanks. Okay, so we are interested in this type of problem in the mean field limit. So we are very interested in this problem when n is large. So when n is large, we can approximate these dynamics using the mckinn vlasov equation. So it looks like this, and the low really captures the uh, distribution of the agent. And uh, this is just a standard McKinnon Velasov equation, and also put the control here because this will control the overall drift. And uh, in the mean field limit, also the average control cost we have looks like this, right? So because it's an empirical average, I just integral this over low t. So therefore, this is our formula. So we have this uh, evolution of the density and then we have the marginal constraint, that's our goal. Oh yes, here I always use one, but it can be any terminal time just uh, for simplicity. So our goal is to solve this with the optimal, basically what we need is to optimize this whole thing over low, which is the density evolution and the policy. Okay, so this is the mean field limit and uh, um, and there are several special cases and which is already, I think most of the audience here should be very familiar with after this week's uh, seminar. So the first one is uh, if we make this problem, if we just remove the interaction, okay, then we get this. And this is exactly the shooting a bridge problem. And the re if we even remove the, the noise, the diffusion, then this is the Panamu Brunier formulation of the optimal transport. Okay, just uh, two special cases. And uh, just like these uh, problems, there's a, there's a way to reformulate this mean field control problem, uh, the density control problem in terms of optimization problem over the path measures. And this is what happens. So we assume P is the measure induced by induced by the control process. So this is the control dynamics and the P is the process induced by this. And the low T is the margin of this at this time T. And this is the, I don't remember what's the name of this type of equation. It's a mean field stochastic differential equation could be. So this one is the one with the control and the Q is the one without control. Okay, but I want to emphasize that uh, even though this doesn't have control, I use P here to denote that, to emphasize that uh, this low is actually the marginal of the first process. So low T is always the marginal of the controlled one. Okay, so this uncontrolled process. So, I mean, the one I defined really depends on the control policy. So if we invoke the design of film, which is a standard in this domain, uh, this uh, quadratic energy can be written as the KR divergence, relative entropy between the controlled process and the uncontrolled, uncontrolled process. Okay, if we combine all of this together, this is what we get. What we need to find is a measure over the path space, which is really high dimensional, infinite dimensional, such that the initial distribution or the marginal distribution at the zero time is the initial distribution and the marginal distribution at the target uh, at the terminal time is the target distribution. This is the outgo and the, we want this, this to be minimized. Okay, this is the control energy. This is very similar to the standard shooting a bridge problem, except for that. This, uh, so in shooting a bridge problem, we would say this is the Q is the prior process. P is the process you want. And you want to find the process which is closest to the prior and, the, and the also consistent with the marginals. But here the difference is that uh, 
the prior process depends on your solution. So that is a major difference. And this is actually makes the, this makes the problem much more complicated. So, okay, good. So, sorry, I just want to, I, I think I, I missed it again. Can you say the prior process depends on the solution? I think somehow I, depends on the control. I, I got a little mixed up. It's here, uh, you see. Uh, um, so the prior process is an artificial prior process. We just made this up. It just fit with this formulation. So we define this to be the prior process. And the reason this depends on the control is because here we use this oh, okay. marginal law, which is the marginal of the control so process. That's like a fixed external potential for the other process, yes. or a yeah. time bearing external potential for the other process. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. It could be like a different process. So, wait, we know it can be YT, but YT depends on X. Because YT depends on ROT, and then you define ROT like. Oh, yeah, yeah. These two are not the same X, you just two processes. But the second one depends on the first one. Yes, the second one depends on the first one, only on the statistics of the first one. Okay. Not only on the marginals of the first one. Okay. okay. Uh, so you mentioned two particular cases uh, in, the, in the last slide. Yes. Do they, do they admit the same reformulation like that? Yes, the special case, uh, you see, for instance, the shooting a bridge, in that case, W is zero. W is zero, then this is uh, remove, you remove this. So therefore the Q doesn't depend on P. So you only have a Q. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, it can always be written in, in this way. If you have noise, okay. okay. So if you remove this P over here, this is the standard standard shooting a bridge problem. Okay, and move on. So even though we were motivated by a very engineering application, this turns out to coincide with a really beautiful paper by Beckhoff and Giovanni and several others. It's called the mean field shooting a bridge problem. It's a very beautiful piece of work. And that you need some quite standard assumptions. Okay, so the goal here is really just like the shooting a bridge, the, the story of the shooting a bridge. So you assume you have M particles, okay? They interact with each other and each of them have this, has this dynamics, okay? Then they have some initial distribution. And then you observe this, they have this target empirical distribution at the end. Now, the shooting a bridge problem basically asks for the most likely evolution between these two observed marginals, uh, considering this is the prior process, okay? It turns out for this problem, you can develop a large deviation principle, which is uh, highly non-trivial, but uh, informal result looks like this. So the probability to observe a specific evolution, P, is proportional to exponential uh, to the power of minus n, n is the number of particles, multiply this KL divergence. So that's why if you want to find the most likely evolution, you really want to minimize this, this guy here. And that is uh, the whole uh, actually large, large deviation story behind the Schrodinger bridge problem. But it just turns out that the thing physics interpretation carries on for the mean field setting, okay? Yes, so just uh, several more equations, no proof. Several more equations about this uh, just to, so if you are familiar with this uh, um, control theory, then just uh, from the, from the uh, fluid dynamic or the mean field formulation we have, it's not very difficult to, to lay down the uh, optimality condition. It's just that uh, the first one is the H hamilton jacobi equation, which characterize the optimality and the optimum control is a gradient of some potential function. And you just plug this back. So you have a coupled PDE system, okay? So that is a, a relatively standard, uh, uh, at least formally, okay? But uh, a very surprising result in this mean field shooting a bridge problem is that uh, you can just like uh, the standard shooting a bridge problem, there is a factorization of the optimal density flow, which, looks like this. And uh, then you have these two factors, uh, phi and the psi. And uh, this psi 
satisfy the backward equation and the phi would satisfy this forward equation and they're coupled with each other in the specific way and uh, again if you make the interaction to zero this just reduced to the standard one uh, and the two completely decouple the system okay so just uh, some theory i'm not going to mention this more uh, it's quite complicated if you are interested in this this paper is really nice mm. What, what I'm going to talk about is an algorithm. It's a one algorithm to solve this type of problem. So that's what I'm going to do. And uh, discretization. Okay, so we are going to question. Here, uh, the optimal, uh, good question. So the optimal control is actually gradient of lambda. Yes, yes, exactly. Epsilon is zero if there is no noise. Uh, if the epsilon is uh, if there is no noise, you don't have this system. Right, right, but do you know what do you get? You, yeah, you just make this uh, zero. It's fine. The, the the algorithm, the theory goes through. Uh, well, what do you mean? What do you get? Uh, well, I presume that the exponential formula for row people would, would be different. Yeah, this this doesn't work. Right, but I think know? I may miss some coefficient here. Some epsilon, but this one would not work. It's just like a, even if there's no shooting, if there's no interaction, if you make the epsilon to zero, then you don't have a coupled system because then it's reduced to the standard uh, optimal transport yeah, problem. Yeah. For optimal transport this problem, we know we, we don't have it. A couple of PD like this. Right, but uh, we do also know on the other hand we know what we get. I mean, there are various forms of. Uh, in which we interpret the optimal transport, right? So yeah. I'm just wondering if you look at what would be the formulation if epsilon is zero, right? I understand that this is not this. Yes. So if epsilon is zero, uh, uh, I think uh, normally people would go back to the one without a logarithmic transformation, which goes back to this one, actually. Right. Okay. okay. So discretization. So uh, now we would uh, focus on this formulation to uh, minimize the care divergence between P and the QP. Uh, it's a the optimization variable is a, is a path measure, is a very complicated. So we discretize this. So we discretize over space and time, okay? It's a very traditional method, okay? Then after you discretize this, then the P um, becomes a, tensor m okay and it's very high dimensional t plus one dimensional is a huge high dimensional tensor but it's fine let's not worry about this for now but if we do this the objective function becomes this okay so uh if i if i just say okay there's no way to cover okay if i remove this m yeah now this is the entropy regularized optimal transport problem. So everybody here would know this. So, and this is just the entropy. I don't need to define this. So the only difference between this and that one is really this, uh, the cost function, the transportation cost depends on your transportation plan. This creates a nonlinearity in your problem. So this is our final formulation after discretization. We call this nonlinear multi-marginal optimal transport problem. So I just put the constraint back because this is what we need to do. Okay, so here the CM looks like this, which is the transportation cost. As you can see, the reason this transportation cost depends on M is because here, this term over here, we need to use the margin of the M to calculate this term. And this really gives you the dependence. And if W is zero, then you remove this. This will really reduce the quadratic cost. So, okay. So we'll come back to this later. So right now we just uh, focus on this problem. It's just a MOT, nonlinear MOT problem. So how do we solve this? How do we solve this? It's, it's already a entropy regularized uh, uh, MOT. It's really, really tempting to use a uh, single, right? So, but it's not quite there 
um, because this nonlinear dependence, we cannot just apply synchron directly. So is there other way to really to utilize this uh, very simple synchron algorithm? So it turns out we can. So what we need to do is we need to utilize another framework called a proximal gradient algorithm. So it's just a detour. It's a, this page is really a completely different uh, notation and different problem. So proximal gradient algorithm. Okay, it's a very standard algorithm to solve composite optimization. So in this problem, we want to minimize this. And we have some constraint set and we want to minimize this. And normally here in this type of problem, one of the F is, is uh, relatively smooth. And another one G is may not be smooth, but uh, normally it's uh, very simple. So normally this is a regularizer, okay? So it turns out for this type of problem, this is a very effective algorithm called the proximal gradient. So basically what you do is uh, you run gradient descent for this component. And then once you have this, you run the proximal map for that part. And then this looks, this is the total algorithm. Okay, this is the gradient direction and then proximal map. Okay, there is a non-Euclidean uh, extension of this. So, so here we have Euclidean distance, but there is a non-Euclidean one. You just replace this by, by um, Bragman divergence, like a care divergence. Then this is the non-Euclidean non proximal gradient. So this is the Bragman divergence. Okay, this algorithm works very, very well. Uh, even when the problem is non-convex, it has the guarantee to converge to local solution. And uh, this is, and uh, has a sublinear convergence. And this is really what we need because our problem actually is, is not, in, in general, is not the convex. So local solution is the, the best you can expect. Okay, so now we just plug this into our problem. So this, pro, this algorithm is for composite optimization. So let's just let our problem into a composite optimization. So we have two parts. Uh, this, is the, this is the cost part, which looks like this. And this is the entropy part. And I put a constraint, I didn't know the constraint to be this just means M is consistent with my marginals, okay? So for this one, if we just run the non-Euclidean, non-Euclidean proximal gradient, then we plug in, then this is what we would get. Okay, it looks long, but it's uh, quite simple. We take gradient of F, uh, this iteration, then you have inner product, okay, then, this is the, the other part, and the, we have this KL divergence, which is the which is the proximal part. Okay, and the KL divergence we know if you expand this, it looks like it's some linear plus some entropy part, and you just expand this, it looks like this. Okay, so this is nice. Why is this nice? This is nice because because this is a linear function of M, right? And this is a entropy. And this is in fact what? It's a MOT problem with this guy being the new cost. And this is the entropy regularization. Okay. And the, what even better is normally when you say MOT is uh, the uh, single algorithm is not stable because the regularization time is very small. Epsilon is very small. Here, uh, the regularization time is not even, I mean, even if epsilon is zero, I can make this non zero. By choosing a relatively small step size eta, I can make this relatively large, really mitigate the numerical issues of this single algorithm. Uh, so this is our problem. And uh, this is the gradient of F, and uh, I'm not going to discuss more, but just a tedious calculation, you can just get the gradient of F, it looks like the cost plus another term, and the other term can be decomposed in this way, okay? It's just some calculation. Okay. So it's good, it's all good, but uh, still uh, in this algorithm, what we need to do is uh, we need to solve a sequence of multi-marginal optimal transport problem. But as we know, in general, 
MOT problem, even a single MOT problem, numerically is challenging. You just think about this in this MOT problem. What's the dimension of M? M is a tensor, is a T plus one dimensional tensor. And even if you want to put a computer to save this, is is very it's impossible. So very often, especially for the application we are interested in. So we need to explore structures. So this leads us to another line of research we have been working on, which is called the graphic optimal transport. Two minutes, okay. Okay, so let me just say, keep moving. So this is MOT, okay. So very often in MOT problem, the cost the tensor is not just a, is not just a big tensor, it has a structure. And very often it has a graphical structure, which meaning CX can be written as the summation of many smaller tensors. And this is what happened in many problems. What is some battery center, spline, and also for our problem, we have this structure. This is largely due to the fact that uh, CM looks like this, and this is a summation of several different terms. And each of this only involves two marginals. So this is the graph corresponding to that. And with these graphic structures, we can actually utilize these graphic structures to significantly accelerate the computation. So this is the, this is the sinkhole algorithm, okay? This is not a sinkhole, this is the, this is the characterization of the solution. And this is the sinkhole algorithm, which is the, which is the, which looks like this. And it has all the nice properties, except for one that uh, in every iterations, you need to do this. PJ, K, multiply by U. This is basically, you have a high dimensional tensor, you want to do the, calculate one of the marginals. If you do this with brute force, you need this amount of calculation, which is uh, impossible. So what good about the graphical structure is that uh, you can do this in a much easier way because this is equivalent to a Bayesian inference problem in the probabilistic graphical model community. So I'm going to skip this. And uh, this is just to show you this operation, what we need is equal to Bayesian inference, okay? And uh, by combining this uh, advanced algorithm, not advanced, standard algorithm in Bayesian inference with the sinkhole, we can get uh, something called the sinkhole belief propagation really to solve this MOT problem with graphical structure very fast, okay? And the finally, this is the, the total algorithm. We call this the proximal sinkhole belief propagation algorithm. It's really combined uh, this algorithm for MOT and then combine this with the proximal gradient, then we sequentially solve this type of uh, MOT problem and uh, we get a solution. And uh, the want to emphasize the complexity of each iteration is in X squared multiplied by T. So which is reasonable in most applications. Okay, uh, I would skip the extensions. You can, if you're interested in that, you can just take a look at the paper. And uh, this is the one example, is one dimensional example, so is uh, it's uh, simple. So just to show you the picture. So this is the initial configuration. That is the target configuration. This is the time. Our goal is to control this from this distribution to this configuration. And uh, I forgot. This is the interaction we use. It's a repulsive, okay? So if, we, if we beta is zero, which means there's no such interaction, then this is the solution which is the MOT solution or uh, as a sharing a bridge solution because we have a small noise there. But if we choose the other parameters, this is just a few examples, you will see uh, this repulsive force really actually affect the evolution of the density and the in a reasonable expected way. And uh, just one more thing is that uh, a few possible future directions uh, we are interested in is that uh, right now the algorithm is a, is a, is a discretization based. So it's nice, but it's not scalable to high dimensional problem. We are looking to, to see whether a particle based uh, method is possible. After seeing 
this week's talk, I think it's quite promising. It's possible. Or you can use some learning method to uh, use another line of research to, to realize this algorithm. Or another thing uh, I'm thinking of is whether this type of problem has any connections to the consensus-based sampling. OK, so I think I'm over time. OK, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks, yes. Th thanks for the talk. Very nice. Uh, so I have um, so a question. If you want, is on the on the very beginning. If you want, so uh, where you say that uh, uh, you don't want uh, the particle to cross, right? Yeah. So not to go too close to each other, but so in this I, I i get this in general but uh, for the problem where basically you are uh, you want just going mu to nu yes with the control yeah actually so if if the noise is zero so i believe the trajectories that you get uh, mm -hmm. you know with wasserstein 2 they don't cross right yes exactly and um, that's a very good point. And um, you have this uh, very good property if you do geodesic interpolation using optimal transport. But the problem is uh, in real robot, they are not point. Yeah, they yeah, are, yeah. They are so my question, point. my yeah. question was uh, really so uh, the relation between because again in the uh, you know in the optimal transport uh, that uh, you have this uh, you know convexity of uh, the L infinity norm. Of the geodesic, mm -hmm. which is basically saying that, uh, uh, so, you know, uh, since it is related in some sense to the mm -hmm. inverse of the radii, mm -hmm. of, uh, so you should expect that the radii are not increasing. Now, mm -hmm. of course, this, this should be like a hardball condition, which is yeah. not easy to prove. And yeah. we are talking about, you know, finite number, yes. but yeah. would you expect that actually this is uh, uh, so? This is really needed? Uh, I believe this is really needed. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, in almost other in almost other swarm platform, I know there's a really the lowest level control. They always enforce collision avoidance. It's automatically is there. Uh, I mean, the solution property of optimal transport map is nice. But I wouldn't really trust that uh, if I apply this to real robot, robotics and due to there are many problems, for instance, some disturbance would really destroy that. So, and the, but if you have this uh, interaction there, then this really, you can guarantee this uh, reasonably well. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Thanks. Uh, I have two questions actually. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say if there is anything no, like after you discretize that you get to the static multi-margin optimal transport problem? Yes. If is anything is no on the limit when epsilon goes to zero? No. Like this, uh, okay. Nothing is no because uh, we are the only work which discretize this. So in that inverse direction, no, I didn't investigate this. Yeah, but I think it's an interesting problem. Yeah, I think it should be doable. You just say uh, we, we didn't do that. In the second question, like, could you comment, like, uh, if there is any relation between, like, the graphical optimal transport and synchron uh, belief propagation? Yes. Algorithm with, like, the works of, like, uh, Max Welling and Pe yes. on probabilistic graphical models and yes. belief propagation. Yes, uh, that's a very good point. Uh, it turns out uh, uh, these two algorithms coincide significantly. And uh, we, after we developed this uh, framework, actually, we found out this algorithm. Um, this method. So, but the angle we look at this problem is completely different. Yes. So there, the way they look at this, they just, uh, it's like a relaxation. So initially you have a uh, Dirac measurement line, then you just relax this by some distributions. So here uh, we started, so basically they started from the graphic model point of view. We started from, and there, and we started from the MOT point of view, and then we end up with the same algorithm. Thanks. Yeah, that's a that's a paper there. It's the same algorithm. Okay, one last question. And... 
then we can take it offline. Did you say something about Tom Rubas? Uh, he wants this. <laughs> can you say anything? Oh. <coughs> Can you say anything about the stability of the optimal control to perturbations of the of the uh, measures? Um, anything quantitative or something? Mm. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, the answer is I, I don't know. We didn't investigate this. And actually what I present to you here is you see after this transition, there is a step missing is that uh, after you get this M, for instance, you need to do some approximation to recover because the policy has to be a continuous map, right? You need some other approximation over there to recover some uh, candidate of the optimal control. So even there, there's some errors. So yeah, we didn't investigate the stability over there. Yeah, we just, in, we just carry out some algorithm. And, uh, and the one advantage of this algorithm is that uh, you see, we have to solve a sequential uh, several iterations of MOT. But the good thing is that you don't have to really go to the very end because you just stop anywhere due to this specific structure. If you stop anywhere, this would lead to a feasible control, which would do the job. And I mean, this may not minimize the cost, but this would drive really the initial to the target. So it's always feasible along the whole path, which is a nice property of this algorithm. Thanks. Okay, thank you Shin, very much for Thanks. a beautiful talk. Uh -huh. Thanks. And, this, and this brings us to the end of a wonderful workshop and let's uh, applaud for Simon and Kathy. Thank you, thank you very much from all of us. And let's applaud for all the speakers. Yes, it was a very, very beautiful. And, and, and yes, and absolutely, it's, it's, it's Simon Institute and the great, great support that we got. Thank you, thank you. Okay, well, I'll take a few uh, final remarks. You can, you can. I